Freddie Mercury was one of the greatest pretenders of all time. Opposing, posturing, English eccentric, with a full plummy accent and a fake aristocratic air. He was also plagued by contradictions. Vivid, arrogant and fearless in public, he could be raw, vulnerable and uncertain behind closed doors. According to some of those who shared his life, his PA Peter Freestone, former barber turned live-in lover Jim Hutton, German actress Barbara Valentin and others, he wasn't hard to read. He wore his heart and his bicep. At times, more than one. Emotionally addicted to the soft affection of women, he came to prefer hard sex with men. Irrefutably, though the global homosexual community has claimed him, he clearly kept his options open. Would we not therefore, by contemporary definition, consider him to have been bisexual? Peter Freestone warns against it. Freddie's factotum for the final 12 years of his life believes that his friend was unequivocally gay. At a fabulous dinner in Peter's honor hosted by our Italian friends Federica Daini in June 2019 at Chesan in Knightsbridge, a superior Indian restaurant and once a favorite haunt of Freddie's, we discussed it at length. Even though Freddie never came out, he said, we should be wary of categorizing him as bisexual. As far as I'm concerned, and I was there in the next room, or quite often in the same one, he lived the life of a gay man. It was the lifestyle he wanted. Why didn't he share that with the world? He had his reasons. Peter should know. I have known and loved Phoebe for 35 years. I also saw and heard enough to wonder. True, Freddie never came out officially during his lifetime. He dropped hints and made cryptic comments, such as his famous line, I'm as gay as a daffodil, my dear. Peter flagged up that Freddie did in fact sp speak quite openly about his sexuality in a couple of interviews. It's there if you look. It wasn't obvious to all clearly. Freddie did indeed have these reasons, which we will explore. Because he has been outed posthumously, he is denied the right to reply. Nor did he confirm that he had AIDS, until the night before he died, when he issued the following statement to the media through Queen's manager Jim Beach. Following enormous conjecture in the press, I wish to confirm that I have been tested HIV positive and have AIDS. I felt it correct to keep this information private in order to protect the privacy of those around me. However, the time has now come for my friends and fans around the world to know the truth. And I hope everyone will join with me, my doctors and all those worldwide in the fight against this terrible disease. It was a load of Freddie's mind, said Jim Hutton, his presumed partner for the final few years. He did seem calmer after that. Though I have often wondered, did he know that was it and that he would die the next day? Or was it just coincidence? It was uncanny, inexplicable and very Freddy. Freddy's former girlfriend and primary beneficiary, Mary Austin, has long been paraded as the grieving mother Mary. Why did he leave her his palatial Kensington home and most of his chattels and fortune when the pair had not been an item for 15 years and were just good friends for infinitely longer than they were romantically and sexually entwined. Could it have been part of the construct, the elaborate mythology fashioned to hoodwink the world into believing that Freddy was a gay man whose tragedy was that he had fallen in love with a woman? That his orientation would otherwise have been straight? But for a single inconvenience by a clip? The implication being that we might have forgiven Gaia her thoughtless aberration, which Freddie could not have helped, whereas we might not so readily have accepted him as bisexual, because there was, at least in the 1970s and 80s, a popular tendency to interpret the latter as greedy. The biphobic suggestion that Freddie could not possibly have been that way inclined would today be regarded as an example of bisexual erasure. Traditionally, our understanding has been that if you are male and have even a slight attraction to the same sex, then you must be gay. 
explains Rich C. Salen Williams, Professor Emeritus of Development Psychology at New York's Cornell University. Even if this isn't immediately apparent, we tell men it will become so once you come to terms with your true self and exit your phase of bi-curiosity of questioning. Women, by contrast, we give more space to be sexually fluid, as the seizable literature on the subject attests. British psychotherapist Richard Hughes is on the same page as Peter Fristo. I'm pleased you mentioned it, he said. I know from what you have written in the past that you hang quite a lot on Freddy's Barbara Valentine episodes. But tread carefully. I really do think that Freddy was a gay man. Homosexual males can easily have sex with women, especially when loads of drugs and partying are involved. I do believe that Barbara had a sexual relationship with Freddy. Having said that, this kind of relationship doesn't necessarily make a man bisexual. He can still be gay. Who is 100% gay? Can anyone define themselves as completely anything? And of course, all of this in turn is defined by the language and theory of our times. There is more nuance and difference now than there has ever been. While Freddy is generally regarded as a gay man, Hughes adds, there was also something queer about him. A pejorative term for a homosexual person in the past. Queer has been revived of late and is used by people who do not identify as normative. Homosexuals, bisexuals, non-binary and transgender people might all define themselves as queer, as might heterosexuals who identify beyond the norm. The language, particularly to older generations, can be confusing. Non-binary, for example, refers to those who do not identify exclusively with traditional gender or sexuality definitions and labels. By gender, a gender and gender fluid are not the same thing as both genders. Many bisexuals define bisexual as being attracted to two or more genders. But some bisexual people are attracted to women and men only, and not to non-binary people. Curioser and curioser. What about pansexual people? Who can be attracted to people of all genders? And who describe their propensity for attraction as relating to an individual's personality rather than biolog biology or orientation. To such folk, gender and sexuality can be irrelevant. In an age in which the majority understand that all orientations and identities are acceptable and valid, how might Freddy have fought? We know, who knows who he would have reacted to a non-binary approach, said Richard Huge. He was fascinated by all facets of sexuality, identity and gender, and he would have continued to explore and play with that, challenging boundaries creatively, creatively and personally. I have long believed that Freddy enjoyed taunting the world with the mystery of what he might or might not be. He had the devil in him, to use an old phrase. He didn't want to be defined. He wanted people to wonder. Exactly agrees a psychotherapist, alienating the whole of America with I want to break free, for example, which was so bold. What was he saying? I'm actually gay? Or I wear women's underwear in private? You know, aren't I risque? Or both? Yes, it was John Deacon's composition, but look what Freddie made of it. He took it all away. The whole thing was a provocation. As for the video... It was outrageous for its time. Rockers in drag, sending up Corey was always going to puzzle them in the US. They had no idea what Coronation Street even was, so the joke fell on deaf ears. America was all Chinas and baseball hats. They didn't get it. Many of them still don't get it. They were also offended by what they saw as cross-dressing. We knew it as drag and thought nothing of it here. We'd grown up on Dick Emery, Stanley Baxter and Danny LaRue. But the drag queen, drag queen scene in the States was still years away. Hard to imagine, isn't it? Now that RuPaul and his glam queens are back, are part of the mainstream culture and almost universally admired? 
But back then, Queen were widely criticized for having made a career damaging mistake. Damaging mistake. Did they? I have to say, I love that level of arrogance. Break Free was extraordinary. That video, that music. It packed such a punch, it hasn't dated at all. It was also ahead of its time. It's why Freddy is a superstar, because of creations and daring like that. Had Freddy lived, he would have been at the forefront of LGBTQIA plus identity today, believe Hughes. I imagine him as an amazing protagonist too, he says. Giving him labels such as gay or bisexual is too limiting. I sort of feel that, while his general flavor was a gay man, it was much more complex than that. It's ironic that he never came out, but that he has been taken up as a major gay icon. The 90s were dominated by gay politics because of the AIDS crisis. It was all about equality and the pink pond. Freddy set the scene for that narrative. He became the gay martyr of HIV and AIDS. But when we evaluate him today, his relevance has increased, particularly from an intersectional perspective of race and class. What is fascinating about Freddy is that he spans different eras. Language and attitudes have changed dramatically. He also lived through several eras during his own lifetime, to the point that we have to stop and think, which era Freddy are we talking about? Most people today are more aware of and more comfortable with the infinite variety and multiple subcategories of sexuality, gender and identity. Freddy's tragedy was never that he fell in love <coughs> with a woman. It was that, due to the prejudice of the times, he was never able to be honest and open about the flexible nature of his identity. Mary Austin was by no means the only woman in Freddie's Mercury life. Freddie Mercury's life. Freddie worshipped another woman so intensely that he seemed almost enslaved to her for a while. She not only awakened him to the 360 heterosexual experience, but also indulged and encouraged his obsession, as she put it with cock. She was a woman with a sexual appetite as insatiable as his, who got him to a tea who brought out his sweetest and his ugliest, who purchased an apartment with him in Munich during the death or glory days, and who was at his side when he discovered that he was incurably ill. She was the late Austrian-born German Jane Mansfield, actress Barbara Valentin. That's her and Queen's video for their July 1984 single It's a Hard Life. Shot in Munich, it is perhaps the most preposterous they ever made. The video is loaded with symbolism, much of which is obscure. Its setting is Venetian masked ball meets lavish operatic production, featuring King Freddy in his court of misfits and freaks, representing the Elizabethan and Renaissance eras, the decadence movements and the Age of Enlightenment. Freddy sports a skin-tight, red, feathered, fish-eyed costume that makes him look like a giant prawn. Barbara is lush in a black off the shoulder number complete with bejeweled skull cap. Leaning over a balcony to gaze adoringly at the star of the show below, her exuberant bosoms are practically spilling all over him. In one sequence, he passes her on the grand staircase, and the camera zooms in on her bare feet. Barbara is seen grinding her naked foot on top of Freddy's. This lends the piece an unequivocal, unequivocal sexual vibe, the food being an obvious phallic symbol. We can safely assume for this, from this, as well as from the ecstatic expression on her face, that there is more than a handshake going on between them in real life. But her existence was not so much as hinted as in the Bohemian Rhapsody film. I was both bewildered and angered by their neglect of her, until I remembered when, where and why I had felt that way before. When I attended the David Bowie Is exhibition at the V&A 2013, I found not a trace of his first wife, Angela. Not a syllable of recognition was she granted for a considerable contribution to the creation of David's defining alter ego, Ziggy Stardust. Angie Bowie 
She who used to hand me signs black and white of her local hero husbands when I was a schoolgirl on the doorstep of Haddon Hall, their home in Beckenham, Kent, had been comprehensively airbrushed from his life. But she had been such an indelible part of it. Who sanctioned that? It could only have been David himself. What he hadn't bargained for was that to exclude his indomitable ex was to draw mass attention to her absence. People were bound to notice and to comment. She had been such an assertive creative influence on David throughout their relationship that she ought to have been acknowledged. Just as Barbara ought to have been for her importance to Freddie. On the first of several days I spent in Munich with Barbara in 1996, we talked from tea time until dawn about the secret Freddy she knew. I heard firsthand about what they saw in each other. He was flawed and frail and flamboyant. A cursed exotic, a damaged diva. So was she. They mirrored each other perfectly. They were equals. Mary Austin didn't get a look in on that level. She was not blessed with Barbara's huge personality. I wouldn't have dreamed of behaving like her. She never flaunted and upholstered in one point, never snogged Freddy in public, never drank herself stupid, never swore, sang, wept all over him, picked fights with flirts who tried to muscle between them, nor made everyone aware that she was there. Mary was demure, dignified and reticent, both publicly and in private. She knew her place and never drew attention to herself. She never put her foot wrong. She was thrifty and fastidious. She was kind and polite towards, but wary of and cautious around Barbara. Apart from the fact that both were blonde, they could not have been more different. Mary must have fretted that she might be usurped by his explosive female fatale. Perhaps she even feared that Freddie might marry her, which of course Barbara desperately craved. At which point, Mary's holdover her former lover turned friend and employer would have been would have disintegrated. She would not be living where she lives today, nor have Freddie's fortune at her disposal. Barbara and I remained close until she died in 2002, age 61. I sometimes stayed with her in Germany. I made a point of doing so after Freddie's funeral, from which, distressingly and unfathomably, she was banned. She returned a favour by flying to London to attend my book launch. Her recollections of Freddie and of their time together were too detailed, too nuanced, too finely tuned and emotionally for Senec to be fraudulent. This honesty and exaggeration have been widely implied, not only by those who resist inconvenient truth as an impediment to a good story, but by one of Barbara's own adult children. While I sympathize, there must be a certain level of embarrassment attached to the thought of the whole world knowing that your late mother used to have sex with a gay rock star, I beg to differ. Barbara was frank about the fact that her relationship with her kid was not close. The Freddy whom Barbara shared with me rang true. He harbored a death wish, she told me. He strode defiantly into the eye of the global HIV AIDS storm, doing everything with everybody just as he had insisted he would to broadcaster Paul Gambaccini during a visit to London's Heaven Club after HIV had emerged, and was tightening its grip on the world. The movie failed to capture all that. Freddy, a figure of unassailable legends, was not portrayed as accurately as he deserved to be. Would he have wanted to be? I think so.